Welcome. Uh, today I'm attempting to record a lecture, and it feels a bit strange talking into a void, but I'll do my best. Last week we spoke about writing and diversity. On a related note this week, I want to talk about writing and power. Uh, so last week I spoke about how diversity has become shorthand on the writing publishing scene for voices and experiences from minority and marginalized groups, groups that aren't part of the majority or dominant culture, the groups that have historically and currently are being denied power, visibility, expression, or who don't have control over the ways in which they're represented in mainstream uh, media and books. So this time I'm going to be speaking more in depth about those power imbalances and how they affect us as writers and the stories we write, whether it be through prose, poetry, or uh, nonfiction prose. So we'll be talking about the subtle power of stories, right? Because I think um, as, uh, you know, aspiring writers or writers, we, you know, all, all um, agree about the power of stories. And I'll be talking about how those, that power fits into the larger landscape of power or how we might be thinking about those relations. Um, and I want us to keep this question in mind as, throughout the whole um, presentation and, uh, you know, maybe this week. Where might I as a writer exist in relation to such power and how does that affect my writing? Um, and how should that affect my writing? Okay. So why do stories have power? Why are people so compelled, transfixed by stories and so drawn to creating them? Well, for one, they help us to travel beyond ourselves, right? Um, they create empathy, um, and they can dispel ignorance. Some of you will have heard the phrase, the unfettered imagination, right? The idea of the writer being able to roam at will and bring themselves and their readers to different lands, different situations, different experiences, different eras. But what I want to discuss today is the dangerous potential of a story to appear to reveal, to educate, to enlighten, to open minds, when actually it isn't doing any of those things. Um, Right? What happens when it seems like a story is doing these things when it actually isn't? What happens if instead it's reifying, reinforcing existing harmful ways of portraying marginalized and sidelined individuals and communities? So I assigned an essay for this week by the Nigerian author Chinwa Achebe. Uh, he's most known for his novel Things Fall Apart, though he's, he wrote several other novels as well. Um, and in this essay, which was uh, written uh, and delivered in uh, the 1970s, actually, as a speech originally, uh, he critiques in his capacity as a literary academic the very famous novella by Joseph Conrad, Heart of Darkness, which is still widely beloved and widely taught as a staple, a classic of English literature. I myself have um, read Heart of Darkness multiple, multiple times. Uh, Achebe starts his essay by giving us a glimpse of the context in which he was operating at the time, 1974 in Massachusetts in the U.S., um, and his area of expertise, and in fact the books he writes, um, being questioned, uh, or rather dismissed casually by a white American academic whom he happens to pass on campus. And um, he includes a little bit of the exchange, what did I teach? African literature. Now that was funny, he said, because he knew a fellow who taught the same thing. Or perhaps it was African history in a certain community college not far from here. It always surprised him, he went on to say, because he never had thought of Africa as having that kind of stuff, you know. By this time, I was walking much faster. And um, the underline, the emphasis is mine there. But this opening sets the stage for Achebe's critique of Conrad's novella that despite the fact that the novella is a criticism of the brutality of European imperialism, the novel actually participates in reinforcing the stereotype of Africans as uh, nameless, inhuman, barbaric. And uh, here's a quote from the essay. The point of my observations should be quite clear by now, namely that Joseph Conrad was a thoroughgoing racist. That this simple truth is glossed over in criticisms of his work is due to the fact that white racism against Africa is such a normal way of thinking that its manifestations go completely unremarked. And the question is whether a novel which celebrates this dehumanization, which depersonalizes a portion of the human race can be called a great work of art? My answer is no, it cannot. I do not doubt Conrad's great talents. And um, right, that's important to note that 
Achebe acknowledges Conrad's talent, um, and th that's not in question, his talent as a writer. Uh, and I remember when I first read this essay, it actually gave me, a huge Joseph Conrad fan, uh, much pause, and it made me think much more about the material circumstances and necessary biases that each author as a human embedded in history necessarily has to negotiate, right? Um, I began to think more about who is writing a story and necessarily from what point of view and what are the consequent effects and what are the consequent biases, right? Uh, Joseph Conrad um, being um, a you know, European male at the time, right, was subject to, um, was a creature of his time, right? Um, you know, one could argue he um, was necessarily a racist because those were um, even, right, the even the views that were most progressive at the time were um, racist by, by today's standards. Okay, so let's step forward to something more recent. Uh, this is a speech given by the American author Lionel Shriver at the Brisbane Writers' Festival in 2016. Shriver is an American author of European descent, um, so a Caucasian writer, and her speech focused on the right of a writer to disregard cultural and racial boundaries for the sake of their craft. Because her argument went, fiction has always inherently been about transcending the self, traveling beyond the self, uh, and the daring thievery, um, that's the word she uses, at, at the term she uses at one point, of others' experiences. And this was the recommended reading, the uh, optional reading I assigned for this week, if you want to see the whole um, speech. But this is part of her, this is uh, drawn from part of her speech. If we embrace narrow group-based identities too fiercely, we cling to the very cages in which others would seek to trap us. We pigeonhole ourselves, we limit our own notion of who we are, and in presenting ourselves as one of a membership, a representative of our type, an ambassador of an amalgam we ask not to be seen. The reading and writing of fiction is obviously driven in part by a desire to look inward, to be self-examining, reflective, but the form is also born of a desperation to break free of the claustrophobia of our own experience. Um, one thing I find personally troubling about the speech is that uh, Shriver doesn't seem to consider what gives some writers the confidence to steal other people's experiences. And I, you know, um, steal because that's the terminology she's actually um, using in her own speech, right? And um, this actually right, um, made me think, right? Um, she casts the writer as victim with certain entitlement, uh, an, uh, an entitlement to uh, take from other people's experiences. But um, historically and currently, who gets the right to travel, right? Who gets the right to steal? Uh, do we risk trapping others in cages so that we can travel unfettered beyond ourselves, right? So to me, it's problematic that this assertion of the individual writer's rights may come at the expense of other people who um, may not historically and currently uh, have privileges, right, to be free, right? Um, and this was something that an audience member and a writer herself pointed out in a reflective piece after the speech was made. And uh, this is a quote from that piece um, uh, from the Sudanese Australian writer, uh, Yasmin Abdel Magyad. Uh, the reality is that those from marginalized groups even today do not get the luxury of defining their own place in a norm that is profoundly white, straight, and often patriarchal. And in demanding that the right to identity should be given up, Shriver epitomized the kind of attitude that led to the normalization of imperialist colonial rule. I want this, and therefore I shall take it. Okay, so we spoke last week. Uh, time a bit about center and periphery as useful terms for thinking about the relationship between a dominant culture or group and the cultures or groups uh, on the margins. This term, These terms, center and periphery, are often used in colonial and post-colonial studies to talk about the relationship between a colonial center of power and surrounding colonized areas. Um, but it's useful, you know, to think about in terms of um, cultural uh, domination as well, right? Um, the, the center casts itself as the site of um, civilization, right, um, of progress, um, and it takes a leader, leading role because it has power uh, in determining norms and values. Um, for example, in the Australian context, right, um, you might say that Sydney is a center or Melbourne is a center or Canberra is a center compared to um, other small towns or, um, you know, remote and rural Australia, right, or you might even think in the context of Sydney, right, um, of the Sydney metropolitan area compared to, say, um, you know, the western suburbs. Um, and, you know, that little box that just appeared there, privilege, you may have heard that term already. And those um, 
I would say, you know, as a makeshift definition, um, refer to the entitlements the benefits an individual has from being aligned with that center and often being, you know, born uh, into that center, right? If you're born into, you know, into Sydney high society and, you know, um, let's say your father's a politician, right? Life is going to be much better for you and you have an easier time and you're port um, perceived a very certain way and respected in a way that um, if, um, you know, if you weren't. Right, so it's um, always useful to think about what this all means uh, in um, your context, or you know, um, I've, I've tried to apply it to the Australian context. Here are a few examples, right, of what might constitute the center and what might constitute uh, the periphery. Um, but I think it's also right uh, useful to think individually on an individual level as well. So about what privileges you might possess, if you do possess any as an individual, and how that affects your writing. And these are issues I actually think about um, a lot. Right, I think about how reading, primarily in English, um, right? I'm a, uh, primarily an English uh, speaker, reader, writer. Uh, affect how does that affect information and the points of view I have access to? How does that in turn affect the stories I write? It's so interesting, especially now with coronavirus, to see um, people who have access to um, Chinese language media um, to be, you know, looking at just like a very completely different point of view, right? And to see how the English media is. Um, villainizing um, the Chinese in this whole um, crisis, uh, for this whole crisis. Um, another question I always ask, uh, what is at stake if and when I write outside myself, and is it worth the risk? Is it worth harming someone for the sake of what I might consider art or, you know, um, experimentation? Uh, and how, I, I like to, you know, um, I don't know, I'm always thinking about ethics in relation to my own work, so I think how can I write in a way that is beneficial and life-giving and works towards the greater good? Who should my art critique? Who should my art raise up? And how am I best able uh, to proceed? So more helpful tips hopefully for you all. Maybe spend some time thinking about your own privilege, the different ways in which you align with the center, periphery, in between. It's not necessarily either or. Uh, consider how your privilege affects your assumptions, the scope of your knowledge, what you take for granted, what you think you know, and how these could translate into your writing. And um, last of all, for the sake of this lecture, ask yourself, why do you want to write about X? Are, and are you at risk of causing harm to those in the periphery? And is it a risk you think is worth taking? Um, this is some interesting additional reading. Right, this, that, this is the uh, piece that I quoted earlier by Yasmin Abdel Magyed, and this is an interesting piece on how um, the English language is taking over the planet. Um, just, you know, a little bit of food for thought about how um, the privileges we get as uh, people who write and speak in English. Um, thank you very much, and that's all.